All right, we're going to talk about osseo, and uh, that's just a way of directly attaching a prosthetic limb. And I'll restrict it mostly to trans tibials, and I'll let Rob talk about the experience with, with uh, trans femoral amputees. So just to go through it quickly to bring everybody up to speed, it's a, it's a procedure that directly skeletally attaches an endoprosthetic limb uh, using a titanium implant. And you put it in much like a total hip, a press fit total hip. And it ingrows over six weeks. And it used to be that we did this in a two-stage procedure. When it was originally introduced by the Swedes, it was a two-stage procedure. Since about 2014, we've largely gone to doing one-stage procedures so that it's all done at once. And it seems to um, improve things overall and is a better way to do it. So you get this uh, structural and functional, functional connection. And it's much like a Wagner total hip stem. So it's uh, porous coated and it's meant to uh, load, in this instance, on the distal end. Uh, it's just put in reverse and then protrudes out through the skin through a stoma. So over the years, it's gradually evolved and developed. And the, the uh, German implant was this ILP, which uh, and has since evolved into what's now called the OPL, which is what we use most of the time. And that is uh, basically the Wagner stem upside down. And up in, um, you know, Munjid El Muderis, my partner in Sydney, who introduced this in Australia uh, in, in, a, in a big way. Uh, started doing this about 2010, and by about 2014, began to switch over to single stage, and has now gone largely to almost exclusively to single stage. So overall, in the world now, uh, it's over a thousand cases now. This is um, a, a bit outdated, and uh, we've done about six, seven hundred almost in Australia. And of those, uh, over 150 are trans tibials. So. It is becoming uh, much more popular. For a long time, we didn't really see the uh, reason to do it in uh, the trans tibia, the below knee amputees, because historically, you're taught that they do so well with a socket. But in fact, they do better, and they are happier with osteointegration. So it's becoming very popular with them as well. Main cause, although most amputees, about 80% of the amputees are dysvascular and diabetic, uh, most of the ones that we do for osseo are trauma patients. And this is a, a woman trans femoral, but uh, uh, it gives you this direct bone loading and uh, restores the alignment of the limb much better. And so you're loading the proximal femur or the um, tibia if, in the case of the trans tibials. And this was one of the very first ones that uh, Munja had done. And I know that Rob's going to look and see how far up it's seated. And, uh, but not all of them are seated so, so deep. Um, I, I had a look last night, Rob, and they're not all that deeply seated. The ones that you've done are, are pretty standard. So, uh, The screws, that, uh, I think during the original designs and things, there was a screw. It was felt that because the proximal tibia is so wide, um, that you don't get as good purchase there, but the screws, we've largely abandoned using the screws now. Uh, the implants have gradually changed over time. Lots of them are custom. We found that 3D printed ones actually were uh, not as good and they're not durable enough and had, there was a few fractures of those, so we've moved away from 3D printed ones and instead have gone back to forged titanium. We have moved recently towards using uh, a pyramidal shape or a, a triangular cross section because the portion of the uh, proximal tibia there is largely triangular in shape, and so this gives you some inherent rotational stability. And you'll see there's a little bit of bone graft that's put in back up at the top there to just give it some uh, something solid to rest upon and things, but uh, that's the normal sort of appearance, and, um, and we've moved away from putting any kind of cables on them. We don't uh, wrap up the fibula into it anymore as we used to. A lot of these things became associated with uh, uh, infections uh, down the line. So it's much easier for them to take on and off. And for the trans femorals, it's, it's a really easy sell. It's really, you know, a very apparent that they are much better functionally. They, um, it it uh, gives them back um, their life in the sense of many of them, uh, uh, the trans femorals, move from being either wheelchair bound or limited mobility or homebound to becoming back uh, active in the community and things. The trans tibials, though, uh, when you speak to them, they feel like it hasn't given them their life back. It's given them their leg back, and basically, it becomes a normal leg for them. They they uh, find it uh, essentially uh, restores that limb. So this is a, a little bit of data that we put together. This was about a, uh, almost a year old now. The data. So this was based on about 23 implants, and 
in 21 patients, and uh, this was the ones that had had uh, adequate follow-up and things, so a minimum of a two-year follow-up for this study. But uh, when we looked at QTFA, which doesn't really apply because this is a, a um, patient-reported outcome score for it's a quality of life in transfemoral amputees, so it doesn't strictly apply, and we need to develop one for the transtibial amputee. There just isn't a score for them. SF36, six-minute walk test, timed up and go. So if we look at this QTFA, and, and when you go to an osteo meeting, someone has to raise their hand and say, oh, it's a QTFA. How can you apply it to a tibia? Uh, there isn't any outcome measure for a transtibial, so we'll develop that. But uh, they are substantially better. They are a lot better in terms of their own patient-reported outcome measure. They are dramatically better. And the SF36 is also uh, significantly better, and you need a minimum of 10 points to be a, a clinically uh, important difference, a minimal clinically important difference, which they do satisfy. So. Six-minute walk test, you know, you walk, a normal person walks about a meter per second. So in six minutes, you should be expected to walk 360 meters. So it restores these people to normal, which was less dramatic. Uh, in, in the, uh, when we looked in the, the transfemorals, it actually, they went from 280 to 420. So they increased uh, over 50, uh, right on 50%. And this was not quite as dramatic an improvement. But that's because a number of these are elderly patients. Uh, these are very elderly uh, some of them dysvascular and diabetics and things, so they aren't as active for other reasons. Timed up and go really didn't change much. We do have a classification of infection sort of a scheme, and and uh, few of these become infected. And I know that that's what everybody's concerned about is they'll get infected, they'll get loose, and then when you revise them, they'll lose bone stock and end up as an above-knee amputee. And uh, while that has happened in one patient, it was because they had a very, very, very short uh, proximal tibia to begin with and probably should have just had a, uh, a, an above-knee amputation with osteointegration uh, beforehand. We did try a number of patients. There's about seven, I think, that had uh, total knees. They had very short proximal tibial segments with osteitis in their knee. And again, instead of converting them to an above-knee amputee and then doing osteointegration, which probably was the better uh, strategy, it was attempted to do a tonally replacement and combine it with osseo sticking out through their skin, which ended up being a bad strategy. Surprisingly, you can do that in the hip, and there's at least 14 total hips we have that uh, are attached to an osseo that then protrudes out through the skin. And it's a su successful strategy in the hip, but uh, for the knee, uh, we don't do that. So in this series of uh, patients, one's been removed for aseptic loosening, to elective soft tissue refashionings and no other significant complications. So our observations based on what we have seen so far, short tibias don't do as well, surprisingly, of course they don't. So uh, the ones that do the best have a very long tibial residuum. And if we do the amputation and uh, preserve a longer piece of bone than you would ever consider a normal below knee amputee. So the way that we uh, actually determine the height is we go 25 centimeters from uh, the floor, because that's the minimum amount. They, they need 22 and a half to 23 to fit all their normal componentry, a foot, and an ankle, uh, pylon, all these uh, attachments and things. They need 22 and a half to 23. So we, we normally aim for 25. So in a tall person, it would might be a much longer person in a uh, piece of bone. In a shorter person, it's going to be a shorter bit of bone, but it's always longer. And the, we have 100% success in the ones that we've done the amputation with the longer tibia. 100% uh, success. Prior history of infection also has a higher risk of infection later. There were certain implants. There was this early version we used that had hydroxyapatite coated implant that didn't perform as well. The 3D printed ones, uh, a couple of them broke, so we moved away from that, etc. Anyway, in the end, longer residual means they have more diaphyseal bone, which means better implant fit uh, and uh, fill, and uh, it's a better uh, strategy and a better way for them to go. So, osteoperception, you're running on time, okay? Sounds good? Okay. Osteoperception is an unexpected benefit of having osteointegration. They feel the ground through their bone. Nobody ever expected this, but uh, what it translates into is their ability to feel the surface, uh, whatever they're walking on. So an amputee with a socket, no matter how able and, and agile and, and fit, if they walk on an uneven surface in a dark room and can't see, they will fall down because they get no feedback from the ground. Uh, whereas, uh, and so falls are very frequent. 
once they become um, an osseo integration and have this osseo perception, they can tell they're walking on grass, carpet, gravel, concrete, pile, <laughs> and uh, they can walk in dark rooms. They know where they are. We don't encourage them to run, but they do, and they send us these videos, and, uh, and uh, now we just restrict them for the first year, tell them not to run. Most of them, you see this one guy walking with a flex foot. Most of them don't like that flex foot. It has too much uh, vibration. It goes back up through their bones, so they'll feel it immediately. And it's something that happens immediately post-op. You can, you can come to their room the day after their surgery, and if you smack on the end of the, the uh, bit of metal there, they know that it's coming straight through their bone. So we go to Baghdad. We've done a lot of them there. There's lots of amputees there. It has the highest rate of uh, amputee per capita in the world. And uh, you go where the money is. So uh, this is a transtibial from there. The soft tissue, again, is something that's still continuing to evolve. And we've gone through various strategies. This is largely based on how we would do ephemeral um, uh, osteointegration. And we'd create this flap of skin and then, and then perforate it through. With the tibias, we find that it's probably better to make the incision and bring it together and suture it around it, which we don't do in the femurs anymore, but it seems to be probably a better strategy for the tibials. Bilaterals is a really good indication or uh, short, short uh, stumps. And so this guy, is uh, that's him walking shortly after. And um, so we have, um, when we looked at it, of the 152 wheelchair bounds that we had, 151 of them are now walking independently. One is pretty early on. Now, this guy's an interesting guy. Here he is. He's walking, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. he's a bilateral transtibial amputee, and he walks around perfectly uh, normally and um, functions at an extremely high level. So, And this is, uh, that's just four months after uh, his uh, procedure. This is uh, somebody not drowning. They're uh, swimming. And uh, it's hard to do that with a socket-mounted prosthetic limb. I don't think it's possible. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think you can. And this guy, uh, I challenge you to tell me which, uh, which leg, only oh one's an amputee. One, one leg is an amputated and the other is not. But, uh, I, I, I have no idea because uh, I can't remember this patient. And, uh, but uh, they function at an extremely high level. That's all you can say. All right, Rob's come down for a couple of visits and, uh, and has brought it back to the U.S. And he's the leading guy here. And he's done 26 cases now, I think. But... But an important part is having a team, and I'm sure he'll talk to you about that. And, and it's very much a team-oriented and team-focused thing. So we work together with the prosthetists, the physios, the, the medical guys, the pain management guys, the anesthetists. It's all it's one big happy, happy team. Uh, we've had the Department of Defense come down from the U.S., Kyle Potter, Jonathan Forsberg. Others have come down to visit and have a look and see what's going on. And finally, uh, now we have established an international registry to follow these patients to assess their outcomes and things. And these are sort of the four of the pioneers. Ricard Brandemark certainly is the guy who introduced it in Sweden. Horst Aschoff has uh, then picked it up from him in Germany and tried some other different things with the implant that were unsuccessful. Munger had gone to Germany to, uh, as a fellow there and studied with Horst for a while before he came back to uh, Australia. And Jan Paul Froke uh, is a Dutch, leads the Dutch team that has uh, come and gone. I think that uh, they ran into some other problems there with their local officials and some other things that uh, had some things going on. But again, these are four of the people that uh, globally have taken it on in a big way. And, and the registry, I think, will go a long way towards uh, making this become more and more of a standard kind of procedure. And again, this is the sort of thing you do. I'm not sure that uh, I would have much success getting across there with two good legs. So I'm sure, I, I believe she did get to the other side. All right. Uh, thanks very much. It's become sort of a global, a number of global teams that are all involved. Thank you.